second uh, uh, iteration of, uh, of Wang Wei conversations with Wang Wei or Wang Wei responding to conversations or interventions. Um, which I do think something like uh, so something along the lines of you know yesterday some kind of some kind of the geopolitical to come or a coming geopolitical really I think is a wonderful thing that almost summarizes all the all of the uh, all of the um, interventions and all the conversations um, and again there's these two their next week is um, Jeff Mulligan and David Graber next Wednesday and next Thursday there might be a, a Gambian stream thing in Venice we'll see. Uh, in a couple of weeks, but not here. Uh, and uh, but we're incredibly happy to have Chantal Mouf back with us again. The last time, was it Francois Julien? Was it? Uh, with Francois Julien together. So uh, we, there was already this kind of China contact, you know, China via Austria and Belgium and France uh, with Chantal, uh, who needs absolutely no introduction, but uh, who's famous for books on democracy, on the political, and just. And, and all sorts of other questions like that. And her work uh, has taken on, partly in the context, we had, uh, we did a, J Joyce Yo, who's, Joyce, 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 yeah, Yo, who's going to be so a bit of a, help us, a bit of a discussion, gave a wonderful um, paper a couple days ago. Joyce is from uh, Taiwan, uh, and he, she was talking about uh, Aga Agamben uh, Kingdom and the Glory, and this idea of sovereignty, you know, which is, of course, a Canadian theme, and Chantal was really introduced Carl Schmidt and thinking about sovereignty and the, the political to so many people, me, for example, and so many others in in the UK and in Europe. So I think there's a lot of a lot of issues on the table, uh, but today's today's paper is on democracy in a multipolar world, and Chantal will speak for 45. Uh, no, as long as it takes. So Thirty minutes, okay. <laughs> Thirty minutes. I'm sorry, I'm a fascist. Yeah. Uh, and then a long way for 25 or 30, as long as you like. And after this, 15. Oh my God! I'll get a little bit quicker. Yesterday was went on and on. Uh, but today's going to be a little bit quicker and concise. And then Joyce for a bit, and then we'll just throw it out, throw it up to the audience for uh, for debate and conversation. So, okay, well, thank you. Uh, yes, so the, the theme of our discussion today is democracy in a multipolar world, but I need uh, I mean, a question mark, by the way, because we are going to see precisely is it possible and how is it possible to think of democracy in a multipolar world. But in order to clarify a series of things, I need first to explain why uh, I put forward this concept of a multipolar world. Uh, which is going to be you know, the center of, of the discussion because uh, uh, we are going to wonder is it possible to have, uh, think of democracy and at the same time to have a multipolar world. Uh, but in order for you to understand the, the, the theoretical basis of my reflection, because this multipolar world is not just something that is stated, it, it comes from it has got philosophical uh, uh, basis. So I'm going to begin by um, presenting the basic tenet of the theoretical framework which inform my reflection, uh, and then we will move to the question of multipolar, and then the question of democracy. Uh, so this uh, theoretical framework has been elaborated uh, in a book that I co-write with Ernesto Laclos, which is called Hegemony in Socialist Strategy, so our radical democratic politics. In this book, we argue that the two concepts needed to grasp the nature of the political were antagonism on one side and hegemony on the other. Both of those concepts need point to the need of acknowledging the dimension of radical negativity and the ever-present possibility of antagonism, which impedes the full totalization of society and foreclose the possibility of a society beyond division and power. This part you know, is very important for my argument later. Foreclose the possibility of a society beyond division and power. They require coming to terms with the lack of a final ground and the undecidability that pervades every order. This means, in, in our vocabulary, in hegemony, recognizing the hegemonic nature of every kind of social order and envisaging society as the product <coughs> of a series of practice, practice whose aim is to establish order, but in a context which is always a context of contingency. The practice of articulation through which a given order is created 
and through which the meaning of social institution is fixed is what we call hegemonic practices. Every order, according to our approach, is the temporary and precarious articulation of contingent hegemonic practices. It means that things could always have been otherwise, and that every order is predicated on the exclusion of other possibilities. That is, it is always the expression of a particular configuration of power relation as it excludes other possible con configuration. What is at a given moment accepted as the natural order, jointly with the common sense, here I use common sense in the uh, way in which Gramsci used common sense, uh, in the sense that you know, it's not something which is natural, but something which is constructed, hegemonically constructed. So, jointly with the common sense that accompanies it, is the result of sedimented hegemonic practices. That is, it is never the manifestation of a deeper objectivity that will be exterior to the practice that brought it into being. So it also means that every order is therefore susceptible of being challenged by counter-hegemonic practices. Those counter-hegemonic practices will attempt to disarticulate the existing order and to install another form of hegemony. So this is a you know, kind of very uh, fundamental theoretical uh, element which are on the basis of our approach. Then later after hegemony social strategy, an important part of my reflection has been dedicated to the elaboration of what I call an agonistic model of democracy which I claim is better able to grasp what is at stake in pluralist democratic politics than the two main models of democracy currently on offer. On one side, there is the aggregative model of democracy, and the, the other one is the deliberative one. The aggregative model is the model which is the Schumpeterian model, which is basically uh, taught in political science department, and whose uh, most sophisticated version is rational choice theory. And of course, the, the deliberative model is the one which is found more in on, uh, political philosophy and whose main representative are uh, John Rawls and uh, Jürgen uh, Abermann. Of course, they are uh, very uh, different, but I argue against uh, both of them because I think that um, they are, well, my, my problem with those models is they're rational in the, they, they uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, individualism and also the fact that they don't acknowledge the role of what I call passion, uh, that is the dimension of affects in politics. <coughs> so my, in a nutshell, my argument about agonistic democracy goes as follows. Once we acknowledge what I call the dimension of the political, and here I, 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 I read my word distinguished between what I call the political and politics. By the political, I want to refer to precisely this, this uh, uh, dim antagonistic dimension, the radical negativity, which is an ever-present <coughs> ever present possibility. Uh, uh, um, is something that cannot be in eliminated. The antagonism is ineradicable. It, 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 and it is because there is this uh, uh, dimension of antagonism that there is this dimension of the political. So we could say, if we wanted to use the Hegelian language, uh, the, the political exists at the ontological level. And uh, then I distinguish that from politics. Politics is the ensemble of practice, uh, uh, institution, discourse, language, game, which are, are going to try to establish an order uh, to, in fact, uh, make it possible human coexistence through precise, uh, precisely hegemonic practices but in a context which is always a context of conflict because it of this dimension of the political, on this ontological dimension. So politics, it takes place at the level of the ontic, or to refer to Heidegger again, why the political is uh, uh, at the ontological level. So once we uh, acknowledge this ontological dimension of the political, then we begin to realize that one of the main challenges for pluralist, liberal, democratic politics, I'm going to use many times the term liberal uh, democracy in this presentation. And I want to make clear at the outset that by liberal democracy, I <coughs> refer only to a political regime. So it's not that it's usually understood a capitalist democracy. I mean, of course, in, as, as we know in, in practically all the cases known, this 
liberal democratic regime is articulated with capitalist relation of corruption. But there is, it, this is a, a, a contingent articulation. There is absolutely no necessity for this political regime to have, you know, in us economic relation capitalist. Of course, many liberals will argue that, but this is not uh, the case. Uh, and for instance, we, we, we've got liberal thinkers like precisely John Rawls who acknowledge the possibility of uh, a liberal yes, democratic uh, pluralist uh, regime uh, whose uh, economic uh, condition will not be capitalist, but some form of, uh, of, of socialism. So if I want to be clear, each time I speak about liberal democracy, it's not you know, uh, uh, about capitalist democracy or any existing democracy, but about a certain uh, uh, form of a political regime. So then, then we, uh, 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 need to realize that one, and of course, let's say, it, it is the Western model of democracy. This is an argument which is important for the discussion we are going to have concerning the multipolar world. So this uh, 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 pluralist liberal democracy consists in trying to diffuse the potential antagonism that exists in human relations. Indeed, the fundamental question is not and or, or, as it is so often envisaged in, in uh, uh, democratic political theory, or to arrive at a consensus, consensus heat without exclusion. Because that will require the construction of an us that does not have a corresponding death. And in fact, an argument that uh, uh, I, I, I've made, uh, um, and I can't enter into that here because it's a philosophical argument, but if, if you want in the discussion, I could certify that, but it's of course central to my approach is that there is no us without a death, because the very condition of the constitution of the us is the demarcation of, of, of the death. No, the, 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 I use, in order to uh, specify that, uh, the notion of the constitutive outside. Every form of identity, objectivity, is at its very condition of possibility, the determination of an old side. An old side is constitutive. Uh, it is inscribed, it's not simply separated empirically, it's something which is the condition of possibility for uh, 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 the, the determination of an identity or of uh, uh, an objectivity. And of course, in this case here, uh, in the field of politics, we are thinking obviously of collective political identity, no? the collective political identity of uh, us cannot exist without the definition of a death. So the idea that we could uh, have a completely inclusive us without a death, it's simply conceptually unthinkable. That is a very important argument you know, that I made again, again besides many kinds of uh, democratic political theory. So if we accept that there is no us without a death, then the crucial issue is how to establish this us-them relation which is, uh, uh, I say, is constitutive of politics in a way which is compatible with the recognition of plurality. What pluralist politics requires <coughs> is the, that the others are not seen as enemies, enemies to be destroyed, but adversaries, adversaries whose ideas are going to be fought, even fiercely, but whose right to defend those ideas will never be put into question. So that is the distinction I made between the notion of uh, antagonism, properly speaking, uh, uh, the, the Schmittian conception, you know, the friend and enemy, uh, 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 with them, the them is, with, it does not, on, is considered as taking even any uh, common uh, uh, um, symbolic space, is simply there to be destroyed, and the, the distinction of an antagonism in which we form not the kind of enemy, but what I call adversary, that is open and who, uh, uh, Although they, they know, they recognize there is no way in which they could ever arrive to rational uh, uh, agreement, they recognize, they say, the legitimacy, the, the right of those opponents to defend their uh, position. And of course, they are also going to accept some, some uh, 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 institutions, some procedures to you know, really uh, uh, arrive at, at, at a decision at, at a given moment. And as, as we know, in liberal uh, democracy, it's the election. So to put it, in another way, we could say that what's important is that the conflict okay, that exists the, the, does not take the form of an antagonism, but a form of an agonism. A well-functioning democracy calls for a confrontation of democratic political position. So it's not the, this, this it's not something which is in a pizza lay that we've got to, to, to accept, you know, that, that, or that we should 
eventually try to overcome. For first, I'm insisting, you know, it's not possible to overcome, but it would not even be good if we could overcome it, because uh, uh, this is the, the stuff of the plural democracy, is this agonistic confrontation. And if this is missing, there is always the danger that this democratic confrontation will be replaced by a confrontation between non-negotiable moral issue or uh, again, uh, uh, between essentialism <coughs> or of identification. And I insist that too much emphasis on consensus together with aversion towards confrontation leads to apathy and disaffection with political participation. I mean, that's such an argument that I made in my book on the political and where I analyze the consequences of, of this, and I argue and for me something which is really important, that the current uh, uh, growth and uh, success of the populist rights in, in uh, uh, many European countries is precisely due to the absence of, uh, 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 of this agonistic confrontation. Why consensus is no doubt necessary, I mean, there I, I think it's important to acknowledge several of consensus, but it needs to be accompanied by dissent. Consensus is needed, but on the institutions which are constitutive of liberal democracy and to the ethic of political value that should inform the political association. But there will always be disagreement concerning the meaning of those values and the institution to which they should be uh, 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 um, implemented. And this, of course, is, is what I call the uh, conflictual consensus. No? A uh, in a pluralist democracy, disagreements are not only legitimate, but they are also necessary. That's, that's my point. But it, it must be disagreement within the context of a, a, a certain basic consensus. So it, there is no possible, if you dialogue, even an agonistic one, if you don't have at least some basic of consensus. So this idea of the conflictual consensus is, is important, I'll come back to that later. Well, let's move now to the multipolar world. My agonistic model has been elaborated uh, to provide a proper understanding of the nature of a specific political regime, no? liberal pluralist democracy, Western democracy. That's how I begin to, to think about it. Because I was not satisfied with, with the way in which this uh, uh, regime was uh, 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 interpreted <coughs> by a democratic political theory. However, I think that some of its insight, and for uh, example, the importance of offering the possibility for legitimate, agonistic form of conflict, and that in order to avoid the explosion of antagonistic conflict, this can be useful in the field of international relations. Indeed, we could say that the situation in the international arena today is in many respects similar to the one that is found in domestic politics. I think there is a lack of an agonistic debate about possible alternatives. Since the end of the Cold War, we have been living in a unipolar world. And this is beginning to change, but it's not yet completely recognized and consequences drawn. Uh, and the absence of legitimate alternatives to the dominant hegemonic order means that resistances against this hegemonic order cannot find legitimate form of expression. And this is why those resistances breed conflicts which when they explode take antagonistic form, <coughs> <less> violent <coughs> form, putting into question the very basis of the existing hegemonic order. So there is definitively a, 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 a problem with this you know, unipolar world with one single hegemonic uh, 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 country where you can see that I've to the dominance of the United States. But contrary to some fashionable view, I do not believe that the solution to our current predicament lie in the establishment of a cosmopolitan democracy. Because many uh, uh, people who are defending a cosmopolitan democracy recognize the problem with the unipolar world, but they say what we need to move is to towards a world that would be a cosmopolitan one, you know, in which a world that would be beyond hegemony, beyond sovereignty. Uh, and this is, of course, the, 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 the center of the uh, uh, theory of cosmopolitan democracy. Of course, 
I can't agree with uh, uh, such a view because I think that the cosmopolitan approach, whatever its formulation, and here I'm going to say, there are many formulations because it's very fashionable at the moment to be cosmopolitan. Everybody wants to be cosmopolitan of some sort. Uh, uh, but in all their different uh, uh, interpretations, in fact, it postulates the availability of a world beyond hegemony and beyond sovereignty. Therefore, negating the dimension of what I call the political. Moreover, the cosmopolitan uh, uh, view is, is usually predicated on the universalization of the Western model, and therefore does not make room for a plurality of legitimate alternatives. And I uh, really believe that all those who assert that the aim of politics, be it at the national or at the international level, that the, the aim should be to establish consensus on a single model, end up foreclosing the possibility of legitimate dissent and creating the terrain for the emergence of violent form of antagonism. Now, because this is really the, the, the truth of my agonistic model. Conflict is ineradicable, but it can take different forms. And it's no, no point in trying to negate it, but what you need to do is to provide the institution that will allow for that conflict to take a form which is agonistic and not antagonistic. So I think that also at the level of international relations, we need to, to think what will be this form. In my view, the challenge that we are facing uh, uh, today is the following. If on one side we acknowledge that every order is an hegemonic order, and that there is no possible order beyond hegemony. But on the other side, we also acknowledge the negative consequences of a unipolar world organized around the hegemony of a single, let's call it an hyperpower, then what's the alternative? And my suggestion is that the solution lies in the pluralization of hegemony. Abandoning the illusory hope for a political unification of the world, we should advocate the establishment of a multipolar <coughs> world organized around several big regional units with their different culture and values. I'm not pretending, of course, that this will bring the end of conflict, but I'm convinced that those conflicts are less likely to take an antagonistic form than in a world where a single economic and political model is presented as the only legitimate one and imposed to all parties in the name of its supposedly superior rationality and morality. And in fact, I think that's definitely the question when you know, the Western model, the Western form of civilization is considered the, the highest form, the more moral, and this, you know, I think that everybody in, in everywhere in the world should adopt this model. And then, obviously, people who don't want to do that will write them. They don't have legitimate channel to express their resistances, and this uh, reads uh, the explosion of antagonistic form. Let me here clarify an important point. By speaking of an agonistic world, because of course when I speak of a multipolar world, I, uh, I envisage it on, in an agonistic way. Uh, 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 world order in which between the, the uh, uh, sorry, um, um, among the different um, regional poles, there will be an agonistic relation, not an antagonistic one. I call that agonistic, but here I'm not trying to apply, strictly speaking, my agonistic domestic model to the field of international relations. What I'm doing is breaking to the fore the some similarities between those very different realities. My objective is to stress that what is at stake in both cases is the importance of acknowledging the dimension of the political. We need to realize that instead of trying to bring about a consensus that will eliminate the very possibility of antagonism, and that of course is you know, the, the, the cosmopolitan dream is, 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 is that, what uh, 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 we need to do is to uh, uh, find a way to deal with conflict so to minimize the risk that those conflicts will take an antagonistic form. No? So the, the, the question is the same. Are we going to uh, allow for conflict? 
to not appear an antagonistic one on, on the form of, you know, the friend and enemy, but uh, in an antagonistic way. But of course, the conditions are very different in the domestic and in the international domain. This kind of conflictual consensus, of which I spoke uh, before, which is based on the divergent interpretation of shared ethical political principles, and which is necessary for the implementation of an agonistic model of liberal democracy, such a conflictual consensus cannot be expected at the global level because such a consensus supposes the existence of a political community which is not available at the international level. Because in that case, it will not be a multipolar <coughs> world if we, if we have you know, the, 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 this uh, uh, consensus. Because that, that would be, there is a, a political community at the international level. And I, I don't believe about that. You know, of course, there is a lot of talk to the, the international community, but we know what it means. They take the, 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 uh, the, the US and, 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 and the Brits. And, and so it's, it's never the, universe, the international community. It's only the expression of, of uh, the hegemonic power. So this is cannot be expected at the uh, um, international uh, level. Uh, I really want to insist that to envisage the world in terms of a plurality of hegemonic blocks requires relinquishing the idea that they need to be part of an encompassing moral and political unit. The illusion of global ethics, global civil society, and other cosmopolitan dreams impede us to recognize that in the field of international relations, one can only count with prudential arguments, and that all attempts to definitively overcome the state of nature between states, and of course the, the idea would be to establish that uh, by the, to, to read that by the establishment of a global covenant, all those attempts run into insurmountable difficulties. I have uh, uh, tried my work to show all oh, the attempts of Norberto Bobbio, uh, for instance, who, who, that, that it, it can't because it, there is always the, the it always supposes that there is some kind of empire you know, who is going to decide, and, and who decides, we know it, it's really the, 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 the one which is you know, the, the master, the, the, which is in, in the, uh, got the so, sovereignty. So we need to abandon all, all, all those uh, things, and this is why this idea of a conflictual consensus cannot exist at the international level and it is therefore a big difference huh, between uh, the kind of agonism that I advocate at the uh, international level and the agonism that I advocate at the domestic uh, uh, level. So, we come now to the question of democracy. What could be the place of democracy in such a multipolar world? It is evident that a multipolar world will not necessarily be democratic. And several of its poles might be organized around different political principles. This is, of course, the situation that we are beginning to witness with the first time sign of the advent of a multipolar world in which China will no doubt play an important role. And we will say, okay, but is it good, the idea of multipolar world in which uh, no, not all the poll are democratic. Well, my position on this question is that a multipolar world composed of, <coughs> of a variety of regions, even if some of them are not democratic, will certainly be better than the current unipolar world because it is less likely to foster the emergence of extreme forms of life. But I do not think that we need to discard the possibility that democracy might become established worldwide. However, and it's a big however, this question will have to be envisaged in a very different way than it is envisaged today. And we will need to abandon the claim that this process of democratization should consist in the global implementation of the Western liberal democratic model. Democracy in a multipolar world could take a variety of forms according to the different mode of inscription of the democratic ideal in a variety of contexts. As I have argued in the democratic paradox, liberal democracy, Western model, is the articulation 
between two different traditions. Liberalism, which is emphasis on individual liberty and universal rights, one side, and democracy, on the other side, democracy, the democratic tradition which privileges the idea of equality, the idea of rule by the people. That is popular sovereignty. Such an articulation is not a necessary articulation, but it's a, con a, con a contingent one. It is a product of a specific history. And for instance, the, uh, there is a very nice little book by C.D. McPherson called The Life and Type of, Demo of Liberal Democracy, where he shows how through the 19th century those two very different traditions were articulated together through a series of common struggle against absolutism. Uh, and uh, he, he showed that through, through this uh, uh, articulation, liberalism became democratized and democracy became liberalized. But it's, it's something that very specific to, to, to uh, a specific tradition. And in fact, uh, um, it has been often pointed out that the liberal democratic model, with its particular conception of human rights, is the expression of a specific cultural and historical context mm -hmm. in which it is it often been noted the Judeo-Christian tradition has played a central role. For instance, there are very interesting, uh, uh, and it, it's of course a very crucial issue today, uh, uh, the role of secularization. Uh, is secularization a necessary part of democracy? Uh, uh, and, and then but, uh, you can imagine all the consequences of that, for instance, for, for the, 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 the democracy in, in, in the Muslim world. Uh, there are very interesting uh, uh, studies, studies which have shown that in uh, no arguing that, in fact, secularization is uh, uh, something which is very specific. I mean, it's, it's it's a post Christian idea which has been introduced through the Protestant Reformation into the, 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 the liberal democracy. So it's, it's something very specific. You know, and we can't, on the basis of that secularization, is a necessary condition for democracy. Uh, so I think that uh, once we understand that uh, the, uh, the Western model is a product of a very specific tradition, I think that uh, uh, um, we must understand that there's no reason to present it as the only legitimate way of organizing woman co human coexistence and to try to impose it on the rest of the world. But it doesn't mean that such a model should not be, we, we uh, in, in the West should not give allegiance to such a model. Of course, for instance, uh, I personally would like to radically democratize this model. But I think that you know this is something which should be done through the, the transformation of a model which is really the expression of the uh, 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 Western uh, uh, specific history. So it is constitutive of our form of life. And I think it is worth of our religion, but there is no reason to say that everybody, everywhere should adopt this model because it's the only you know, rational, it's the only uh, uh, moral one that is, that it is often argued. And in fact, most of uh, well, would we'll maybe much, much less, less we'll make uh, uh, less uh, uh, wide-ranging claim of democratic political theory precisely trying to show that this is the model that should be chosen by individual uh, in, in you know, specific idealized condition uh, and, and, and try to justify you know, the, the, the necessity to universalize this model. So I think that we need also to acknowledge that the kind of individualism which is dominant in Western societies is alien to many other cultures whose traditions are informed by different values. And democracy, under the rule by the people, I think that's basically what democracy is, what demos uh, uh, let's come back to the, uh, 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 what it means, can take other forms in which, for instance, the value of community will be more pregnant than the idea of individual liberty. We have then to recognize also that the idea of autonomy, which is so central in Western liberal discourse, and which is at the center of our understanding of human rights, might not have such a priority in other cultures, where decision-making is less individualistic and more cooperative than in Western societies. This in no way signifies that those cultures are not concerned with the dignity of the person and the condition for a just social order. Because 
you know, men, so often uh, the defense of liberal democracy is made of the argument that it's the only possible shell for human rights. But I think here, again, it's very important to, to uh, see that human rights could be expressed in many different vocabularies. Here, I think that the work of Raimondo Panicar is very important. Because uh, Panicar has precisely made the argument that what is at stake in the idea of human rights is, in fact, the recognition of the dignity of the person. Raymond Panicar. Raymond Panicar. Uh, is, is the recognition of the dignity of the person. And that this dignity of the person, I mean, the, our Western vocabulary to express the dignity is human rights. But in other cultures, and in fact, Panicar is a, a, a good. Uh, uh, he comes from a Catalan and, and Indian uh, uh, family. I think it's the, the, the mother was uh, 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 Catalan and the father. And he knows very well the Indian tradition. So in fact, he's, he, are, he is arguing uh, about the way in which in the Indian tradition, this idea of the dignity of the person uh, is expressed a very different vocabulary than the one of the human rights. Uh, um, so uh, what is important is to recognize that uh, other uh, uh, culture and tradition deal with this question of the dignity of the person in a different way. And this is the, why uh, uh, the search for what Panikar called homeomorphic equivalent of human rights. Mm -hmm. He said that you know, the, the, uh, human rights is a specific Western vocabulary, but we should look, look for the other vocabulary, homeomorphic you know, equivalent uh, of human rights. This is very important uh, uh, to uh, uh, act, pluralize. This idea. Uh, it is, of course, important for democracy to, to accept this globalization because societies that envisage human dignity in a way which is different from the Western understanding of human rights are also going to have a different way of envisaging the nature and the role of democratic institutions. So, to think seriously, value pluralism in its multiple dimension requires, I think, making room for the pluralism of culture and form of life and political regime. There is not just one good regime, not, but there are possibility of different form of, of good regime. <coughs> and I think that leads us to uh, 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 see the importance of acknowledging the possibility of what is called multiple modernities or uh, alternative modernities. And to accept that the path followed by the West it's not the only possible and legitimate one. And that non-Western societies can follow different trajectories according to the specificity of their cultural tradition and also the specificity of their religion. Once it is granted that the set of institutions constitutive of liberal, liberal democracy are the result of a contingent historical articulation in a specific cultural context. I insist on that because it's central to my argument. Contingent historical articulation in a specific cultural context. Then there is no reason to see their adoption worldwide as the criteria of political modernity and as a necessary component of democracy. The pluralist approach needs to envisage the possibility of other forms of articulation of the democratic ideal democratic ideal of the government by the people, articulation in which religion, for instance, might have a different role in religion. It's a very big question today, no? that we need to, to the moment when one is thinking of the way in which you know, the, 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 the Middle East and the Arab countries can uh, democratize. It, 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 but many, for many people, democratization means they need, need to westernize. But I think that that's really very, very dangerous. They need to find a way that they can inscribe the, 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 the democratic ideal in their uh, tradition. So, in fact, I will uh, uh, say to, to conclude that what's a stake here, really, is the recognition of what Carl Schmitt, uh, I can finally to, to put him, it, insisted. The world is, a, is not a universe. The world is a pluriverse. Thank you. I would be really very interested uh, in, in, in knowing uh, what you think about this multipolar world and also about the, the idea of you know, this multiplicity of form of democracy. For me, uh, 
will be very nice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for oh, no. this uh, very challenging and uh, inspiring talk. I'm not, I'm not sure whether or not I'm in a proper person candidate to make comments on this topic. I try. Um, um, let me start it from some historical backgrounds. Because basically, uh, I think that uh, Shantar's uh, the arguments uh, is composed of several uh, the concepts, uh, the one obviously antagonistic, agonistic, that's very basic, and also the political and hegemony, or the political and the politics, that, that the, uh, every order is a hegemony, so that's an radical activity. And so on, so forth. move on to the issue. It's a, it's a move pro-verse, not the universe, not the universalism, a certain kind of the pluralism, but multipolar structure and I try to introduce that his uh, her uh, theory of the uh, agonistic into the international order that that uh, domain so how whether or not let's uh, talk about this uh, let me start it from some historic fact that uh, when I read this uh, book uh, especially this part Immediately uh, from the first chapter to the second chapter. Shantaku book. Yes, right, the Anglistic. It's a fascinating book. And uh, they reminded me of some early works in the 20th century, the political thing, not only Schmidt, but also from Chinese or from other backgrounds. Uh, I think that the, what happened in the 1950s, late 50s to the 1960s, that uh, there were several, because at that time, is a polar structure, not a multipolar, but try to create some multipolar structure. Bandung Conference, obviously, is the efforts to create the multipolar structure in the polar structure, right? It's, 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 it's the efforts. But at that time, the, 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 the polar structure tried, at that time, the socialists not collapsed, so they are still very confident. So that's why I reminded me of the two theories. One is a Mao theory, and the second is a Khrushchev theory about the international and the domestic. And basically, the Mao's argument in 1957, he talked about the uh, internal conflicts within the people. You know, that's an antagonistic, not an antagonistic. So basically, his argument is in 1957. He, he, he very important piece by Mao. He talked about the how how to handle the uh, contradiction within the people is an antagonistic and uh, not necessarily eliminate the contradiction. The contradiction that was permanent, eternal, consistent. But that the political, in that sense, within the socialist state could be angolistic. So that's the, uh, the, his, uh, his argument here. So in that sense, you find that the precondition for him is that the uh, antagonistic relations was on the other side. So, because antagonistic always could be located within the relationship between, or the between the antagonistic and antagonist. It's very difficult to imagine at that time, it's still in the Cold War, to imagine uh, antagonistic, the, the way of antagonistic without an antagonist. This is the, uh, the basic arg argument in the 1950s, late 50s, because his, his argument is that it's also related to the hegemony issue. For, for him, the hegemony is a socialist state, the worker state. So because of the, the emergence of worker state, the contradictions came to be internal. So, so that's why how to handle, the, how to tackle the relations the contradictions, the conflict within the socialist should be in the way of the antagonistic rather than antagonist. That presupposes the transformation of that the, the certain kind of the contradiction in the way of the an antagonist that can be transformed into the antagonistic. For example, Mao said that the contradiction between the workers 
and the, the national bourgeois, the national capitalists, could be thought as a contradiction within the people. So that's why the way to handle that was antagonistic rather than antagonistic. But still, the, the question is that the, for him, is still the basically, it's only within the precondition, is in the framework of the hegemony, is a so-called socialist state. Without that, it's very difficult. Without the political condition and the framework, it is very difficult to think of all kind of the contradiction or clash could be uh, took the form of the antagonistic. So <coughs> this is the one question. And the later, we know that the, there were debates between China and the Soviet Union. One of the issues was raised by the Khrushchev, because at that time, Khrushchev suggested that we could talk about the competition, peaceful competition, between the socialism and the capitalism. We can remember that. Then Mao immediately criticized. He said that not possible, because there were always antagonism between the socialism and the capitalism. And there you can talk about the, uh, the, 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 the contradiction within the people. So these are the two kind of the types. This is the, in the uh, Cold War structure, because now we are talking about the post-Cold War. So that's why the, uh, the, 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 our discussion is happening in the context of the post-Cold War condition. And uh, that, the, uh, uh, in, in the dialogue with the cosmopolitan, so for the, the scholars is, that argue with the, uh, the uh, 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 cosmopolitanism, different forms of cosmopolitanism. So that's what I, uh, I want to raise the, the, the question is that, is there any precondition for the antagonistic? I mean, are there any outside of for, for that form? Because basically liberal democracy could be thought as a precondition. No matter how we think about it in different forms, but still, that the precondition is the form. The starting point is a liberal democracy. It's almost like, a, for Mao, it, it, was, it was the socialist state. So in that sense, certain kind of, can we imagine that when we talk about the uh, uh, multipolar structures, and the multipolar structures, and, uh, and also the multipolar st structures, when we talk about the multipolar st structure, as well as a starting point of political thinking as the liberal democracy. So is there outside of the liberal democracy in the political thinking in that? In that? I mean, when we talk about agonistic, I'm, I'm not sure whether or not I'm, I'm clear in, in the race these kind of questions. Because what's the difference, the historical transformation from Cold War time, post Cold War time? Is there, is really that the, the, uh, the whole outside, that only the, in the form of the antagonistic, that the form disappears or could be disappeared at least. So that's the, uh, the, the, the one, I think is the one issue. So how, that, that's still the how can we understand the uh, relationship between the antagonism and the antagonistic in, 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 in understanding of our political, the, the idea of a political. <coughs> uh, this is the, the, when the, the first, uh, the I'm, I'm, I'm considering about these kind of the questions. Second, it's my impression that the, your, uh, your arguments, and especially the political and the hegemony, on the one hand, you argue with those cosmo cosmopolitanism, and also maybe I read your some uh, early works on the discussion, the, the criticism, uh, criti critique of the Habermas roles and the, or their idea about the ju justice. I think that's also related to your concept of agonistic. So uh, that's a political, I think it's so important. But on the other hand, you, as you mentioned, uh, <coughs> yeah, there were other paths, because the left wing, they talk about the withdrawal from the state, for example. So in, uh, you, your, your argument is that the uh, hegemony and uh, representative politics, to some extent, is, is inevitable. So you always need to engage in. So that I am very sympathetic, almost agree with that, because without that the engagement with this, 
politi political struggle within that the, 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 the politics is, is almost sometimes you lost your space for the battle. So this is the, I agree with. But on the other hand, we need to consider maybe the, uh, the transformation of democracy or the crisis of democracy now. Because basically, the democracy in, in today's context is the factor of the so-called depolitic depoliticization, or the crisis of the decline of representation, or the decline of the representativeness. Which means that in the domestic politics, it is almost very difficult to have a real representative politics. Now, that, that's the, uh, the core of the uh, crisis of the current uh, the, 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 the democracy. So in that sense, how can we engage in the politics in the crisis of, or the decline of the representation <laughs> or the decline of the representativeness. Because basically, the, uh, it's not the pure, it, it's especially for, the, uh, for, for democracy, we're talking about not only the state, the form of state, but the party politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the, 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 the core of the crisis of democracy actually is the uh, crisis of political party, the political organization. All these political parties lost their representativeness, or the, that's the so-called decline of re representation. So in that sense, how to engage in the politics, in these, in these the, uh, context of, of the, uh, you, to some extent, it's quite a universal crisis of democracy in, 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 in the whole way. And also that kind of the uh, crisis of the, uh, or the decline of representation, not only happen to the democratic state, but also to other form of the uh, modern states, let's say, whether or not they are, the, for example, in China. China is not the liberal democracy, obviously. And also, the, the crisis of, of Chinese politics is not necessarily mean that the, it's poli uh, the democratic or non-democratic. -demo the, basically the same that the, the decline of the uh, representativeness. The Communist Party was who they represented for. You don't know. So that's why the integration of political organization or the political parties into the framework of the uh, state itself represented the uh, depth of that uh, the crisis of the representativeness. So in that case, we when we talk about these, uh, the precondition of these issue, how can we, uh, for me, is that the, no matter the, uh, especially agonistic is a, is a kind of the, another, is a form of the, of the political. So which means that the, in this context, it's very difficult to create that the political form. So in that sense, that the agonist, uh, how can we have the real dynamic, historically speaking, that the Repoliticizedness, or that. How can we have that antagonistic figure in the context of, of this <coughs> crisis of the uh, uh, representativeness? So, this is another question. So, this is not, I think, these were not necessarily happened between, the, between Western and non West, democratic and non democratic. Maybe the, uh, the, the whole crisis. In the whole, I mean, in, in the globalization, this is a new form of the crisis, which surpassed the difference between the political forms, but in the sense of the Cold War. Because we, in the Cold War context, we talk about a democratic or non-liberal democratic, a socialist a dictatorship and so on and so forth. But now, you find that in each society, in the different political forms, but they actually have the common crisis, political crisis. In that sense, we need to overcome. Angonistic is the core of issue, the lack of angonistic, or the lack of the political. It's not necessarily that kind of the lack of the absence of the uh, political. It's not necessarily happened between the liberal democracy or the non-Western non form of politics. It's really a kind of the new forms emerged. So how do you deal with that? Related to the issue, later issue about the religious, the secular issue. The secular issue 
or the religious issue, Islamic issue, or Confucianistic, and those uh, those uh, mod, uh, multicultural, the, the, the Eisenstein and the Charles Taylor, and those. Basically, I think that the, the uh, multipolar structure that presuppose that the certain kind of necessity of the uh, certain kind of the recognition, the politics of recognition, into that the political. Uh, the experiments in the in a, in a national level. Now, but but that obviously presuppose there were certain type of the uh, cultural type, because you see, there's a Confucianism, Taoism, or the Islamic, and so on and so forth. However, in these globalization, especially these certain form of the uh, global capitalism, financial capitalism, each society were transformed so much. So in that case, it's typically how can I identify that the polar structure? Uh, by reading into the so sophisticated the, the compositions of in each society. I mean, this is the, 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 the question is, for example, not talk about the non-Western countries, but talk about the Western countries. Uh, for example, the Jose Casanova, and the Habermas and the Charles Taylor, they talk about the uh, post secular, let's say. Whether or not we agree or disagree with the, their arguments about the so called the post secular society, which means a certain kind of re religionization within the, the uh, market society, not necessarily secular. It's really, uh, on the one hand, is a fundamentally marketization of our society in this age of the uh, financial capitalism. <laughs> but on the other hand, there were issues, so-called post-secular, emerged, right? That the, the debate on the post-secularism. The debate on, on the uh, post-secularism directly questioned the basic principle of the division between the church and the state. They argue that a certain, this is no such separation, but only the certain kind of, whether or not rational or non-rational differentiation of the state. And the, uh, then the, a lot of the, uh, the, the issues follow up, which means that the new challenges in our age, that the uh, globalization created uh, so many difficulties that difficulties also happen not only in the West but also in other countries, like China. Whether China is a worldly or the religious, we used to say China is 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 a worldly or the secular. But the secular is always the term secular. What could, as you said, this is a European idea because always use it in the binary of the religious and the secular. If without that the religious society, how can you define the secular? But the worldly, I think it's a very good term you use that. But on the other hand, we know that not only in the Tibet, Xinjiang, those the, the really are very strong comeback <laughs> of the, the religious forces, but also in China, the, according to some sociologists in Shanghai, they they calculated the num population, the number of the population, big time talk to be. The, uh, they, uh, the number it's, uh, the, the uh, religious population. It's a lot of the overlaps. It's um, 300 million, right? Yeah, in China. <laughs> so this is a new phenomenon. How can we define that th this new tendency? And uh, together, which means that the post-secular issue, to some extent, also happened in a society like China which used to be defined as a non-religious society. But it's not, the, uh, not necessarily mean that we go back to the religious society, but certain phenomena similar to the uh, post-secular phenomena emerged. I happened to, uh, to be uh, at a forum on atheism. Atheism is a Marxist, materialistic, and so on and so forth. Those scholars feel very sad that the, the discipline of atheism almost collapsed in China 
without the, any support, even not the support from the very few support from the government, but the, each university in China, if you do the research, you are the scholar in the field of the religion studies, you got a lot of the resources, you see, that the, you find these are kind of the phenomenon. So in that sense, I, I, when we talk about the, the global order, of course, then how can we integrate all these phenomena together into the rethinking about the international relations or the international order? So on the one hand, it's a still we are living in a nation state system. That's why the different powers and different uh, the, the products matter. But on the other hand, we find that the traditional divisions between, on the one hand, the cultural difference were there, but on the other hand, you find there are so many convergence, let's say. It's not the, of course, still the divergence, but some convergence. Not only the divergence, but the convergence emerged in this way. And how can we integrate these new phenomena into our political thinking about the, uh, the world order? This is the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, another uh, question. The last one, I think that the, still, the, basically when we talk about the, the globalization or the global order, still I feel that the most difficult issue is the economic issue, the financial or the uh, new liberal order. That transformed the dip deconstructed the social bonds, right? That made that even religious society became so individualistic. If you look at the, you, if you visit those areas, which even like, for example, Tibet, or the, the Xinjiang that in China, but on the other hand, in the daily life, the behavior, it's become very individualistic. On the other hand, it is a very radical, move towards the uh, fundamentalism. So these are the two kind of the forms. So in that sense, it's not the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, difference between the culture or the, uh, the, the, the civilization in the 19th century, early 20th century. But now these kind of differences happened in each society, sometimes overlapped, sometimes divergent. This is a very different uh, situation. So how can we have a kind of, when we talk about the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a kind of the, uh, the order or the democracy in the whole, I mean, in, in the global scale, and how can we deal with that issue? Uh, and also, it's almost not possible for me to not, not discuss a, a transform the uh, econo economic form to think about the political structure. So that's the another aspect. Uh, I think that the most difficult part was it's not only the uh, I mean the, how can we integrate the political uh, develop the different forms or alternatives into the political thinking. It is basically this is the the whole transformation of a society now was dominated by this. It, the, the, these kind of the new form of the capitalism. Not only in single society, but almost every society, but linked together in a un, very unequal structure, globally speaking. So this is a very unequal structure. And so let's, this is the, 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 I think these are a very difficult the situation. That's why I think that the uh, go back to the 50s or the 50s, the, the, the issues like a Benham conference because that was in the polar structure. Now we are unit. It's only a single power there. At that time, two powers. But try to insert the third forces into create the multipolar structure. But that moment succeeded for some times, at least from 50s to 60s. Or that created the, the uh, I think that the contribution, the great contribution to the end of the Cold War. It's not only the, uh, the later Soviet, but, but also globally speaking, without the Third World, the moments, and the national liberation moment in these societies, and certain kind of multipolar structures. It's a precondition for the, for the uh, transformation of the uh, 
from Cold War to the post-Cold post the War structure. But that, at that time, the, uh, in the global structure, obviously the certain kind of the antagonists were there because the base, at that time were, took the form of anti-imperialism. So this is the uh, basic the, uh, the, the form. So in the unipolar structure, how can we do that? What kind of the political? Really, we can create it to transform that the unipolar into the multipolar in that sense. But the multipolar is not only, from my point of view, it's, it's not only because if we only use the multipolar in the uh, means that the different powers, which we means that we focus on the category of the politics. Multipolar in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you see that a certain kind of political there, which means that a certain kind of political value were raised. That's why the anti-war anti -war movements in the West, in America, in the European, and those the liberal liberation movements in the third world countries can interact together because there were political value there. So it, it's not about the structure, but also the political process there. How can we do that? It's my, all my, not the address to your paper, it's really inspiring to me. So that made me to think about the, all these very confused questions. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Uh, I just show uh, three examples of uh, visual uh, artist work oh. as a response to Professor uh, Moon and Professor Wang Hui's uh, talk. Uh, but before that, uh, let me uh, just. Uh, I am very inspired by uh, Professor Moon's uh, talk and also Wang Hui's uh, uh, work uh, for a long time. Uh, so today they, they actually brought up a very important issue for us to rethink radical democracy. Uh, whether we could think of this uh, agonistic intervention, but whether that intervention could be situated in the low, uh, global or the local sphere. So before we do that, we need to think what about the demo or uh, plural form in the international sphere or the demo in the domestic sphere. Who are the uncountable or the un uncounted and the unthought part in the society or in the international sphere? Okay, when we talk about the uh, part of the uh, Sambat in, in our local sphere, but what, who are the, the, the uncounted in the international sphere? So how can we discuss the representative and the public space, space for each and every one, if we do not know who are the parties about. The question of inter, uh, interiorized <coughs> order of external antagonism, predetermined by global and international powers of different forms, including, of course, the economic the, the, the flow of the capital and, of course, the, the other forms. So when we talk about geopolitics, as, uh, Scott was uh, very interested. Shall we also talk about the psychic geopolitics in uh, ambivalent form? I mean, uh, and when we talk about multipolar radical democracy, can we really talk about it in this international form without, or domestic form without knowing what is the local predetermined by the global? So. How do we conceive of a space of uh, radical democracy when we do not know where is the border, or the ideo either it's an ideological border or economic border or psychic border? And how can we make space for the unrecognized or the disavowed experience and hence alter the shareable space? How do we deal with psychic geopolitics when it is a uh, determined or pretty condition or constituted through a long historical processes uh, that is uh, inter, uh, inter, in, uh, was uh, regulated by international law. How do we face the ontological ag uh, an agonistic, uh, antagonist, no, the, <laughs> right, yeah. no. How do we face the antagonistic condition uh, or how do we carry out the agonistic, uh, ontological agonist, agonistic resistance uh, when we do not know that uh, antagonistic conditions is constituted already through the social con uh, consensus or uh, historical processes. So just three examples. One, of course, very famous, Ai Weiwei. He's a, a gesture of uh, uh, challenging the past. Actually, uh, it's also feeding the uh, international uh, art market, the, 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 uh, the interest, curiosity for the ancient China or this uh, the empire of the Qing dynasty. His, uh, uh, his welcome, of course, internationally, and his uh, exhibition of this uh, at the Tate Mo Mo Modern, right? the uh, millions of uh, uh, seeds, uh, some flowery seeds, uh, <coughs> okay, was uh, enjoyed by the uh, the the the, uh, the participants uh, of maybe a London uh, uh, audience or visitors, and but they, they, they took it as a, a resort uh, area. For example, it's like a uh, like the uh, seashore uh, uh, bathing under the sun. And, uh, but uh, for every week, he actually re. Uh, or recall the uh, experience in the socialist uh, period that is uh, working together uh, the, the in, with uh, 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 communal uh, collaboration and so on. So for his uh, like 12 months uh, 
process of this work of uh, each of this uh, processing uh, uh, seat, uh, some sort of a, a communal experience was uh, re revealed. But it's rare, but and also it's only a momentary, mo mo momentary, but uh, it happened. Another example from by a Taiwanese uh, contemporary artist, uh, Chen Jielin, he started his uh, project of modernity, questioning the modernity, because he, he said that uh, he was born in this uh, martial law period. And uh, he wanted to question why he was situated and placed in this, uh, uh, was born in the 50s and uh, uh, was uh, conditioned by this uh, Cold War dichotomy between the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, guarded uh, uh, liberal democratic uh, bloc against a socialist uh, bloc, but he uh, that for for Taiwan was also a result of the civil war. So he and also that's the beginning of the the moment when the local antagonism between the migrants from mainland and the local uh, Taiwanese uh, inhabitants uh, who grew up during the Japanese colonial period. So this split, both of this uh, civil war situation and this, the local Taiwanese and the mainlanders uh, conflict uh, drove him to re-stage uh, this uh, self-mutilation and this uh, the historical uh, traumatic moments of, of course, in some, one of, someone knows about the 228th and uh, the massacre uh, launched by the uh, KMT uh, army against the local people. But this is uh, not only that moment, but he started to uh, very early, uh, for example, this uh, late uh, uh, period uh, intervened by this uh, Western technology. And so this is, for him, genealogy of self, of, for example, as a, a, a Taiwanese who were, was born in the 50s. And also this uh, purgation be, uh, between the comp of the uh, KMT uh, <coughs> party against uh, the uh, Communist Party and the Civil War. But he's uh, restaging this uh, traumatic experience. On the one hand, uh, brought his audience back to this uh, forgotten memories of this uh, the schism or this uh, split. Or, and, but this is not only a schism or the split, but it, it created hierarchical orders within Taiwan society, the local domain, uh, the, the, uh, the part of the people were considered lower class or second class and so on. So, his uh, project actually moved on uh, uh, after that uh, project of modernity to this uh, factories, which affected uh, uh, Taiwan uh, 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 rural uh, society. Another artist, uh, Chen Jielin's father was a, a veteran from China, so he was actually a, a, a so-called Weizhen, and that is uh, his uh, ancestor was born from uh, mainland China. Chen Jie, uh, Wu Tianzhang, another artist, he, his parents were uh, uh, educated in the Japanese colonial period. And he was, uh, of course, their native language is Taiwanese. But his generation, because of the language policy, the cultural policy uh, conducted by the KMT government, so Taiwanese, the native language, was dismissed or un or forbidden to be spoken in public or to uh, or to serve uh, public uh, uh, services and, and so on. So his series of work, like Chen Jielin in the uh, 90s, his series of work were a series of questioning of the sense of home or heim. So I, I call it, it's like a, a project <coughs> of unhandlish. On Hanish, that is because uh, he actually uh, presented uh, this uh, moment of this uh, uh, to a left this, uh, in the 60s and the 70s. He called it the age of innocence when the Mainlanders and the uh, Taiwanese people encountered and when the government was trying to build a new homeland 
but this new homeland has its internal secrecy and uh, betrayal and uh, uh, against its own people. So he, he uh, but when he presented this uh, sense of social abject because those uh, Taiwanese people with their accent, with their dress, they were spotted right away as inferior or the, the abject. But he, he presented this sense of un, uneasiness in a sense, like Fanon said, uh, epitomization, the internal inferiority was uh, uh, projected or transplanted on, onto the sense, sensations on, of the skin. But he, again, removed it toward the canvas. So his uh, title actually is very interesting, uh, Dream of uh, Imper uh, uh, Impermanence. And uh, that it's a desire for permanence and being together. And a dream of past uh, ever. Or uh, his uh, home sweet home, a series of home sweet home uh, uh, images. But it's all uh, betray this uh, the secrecy and the betrayal in the domestic uh, domain. So, but what's more interesting is that besides the subject matter, he added uh, uh, all these accessories. Uh, the fakeness, the pretentiousness, and the momentary uh, 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 habitation of this uh, Taiwan uh, uh, location. So the collage of the object of past experience uh, is externalized, but it bring, brought back this ambivalent feeling toward the past. So in the same boat, or the blind man passing through the alley, What's more interesting is not just this uh, subject matter, but the, the strange uh, a proportion of these figures and the, the, the color, the shining, and uh, very unpleasant. Yeah. No, one minute. Yeah, one minute. <laughs> uh, of, of, of this cloth, he, he chose deliberately this facial sh shining uh, 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 color and tonation of this cloth. And there's a state of vigilance. Uh, this is Su Ye Fei Xie, so one phrase in the national anthem of the uh, Republic of China. So this, actually for him, uh, he unknowingly, uh, he brought back this sense of un uneasiness through this uh, shining uh, tonation, uh, uh, tone of this uh, color and uh, this uh, dress and, and on the canvas. So what I was trying to show is that the borders within ourselves, if we do not know it, then they create new forms of antagonism. It could be religious, it could be ethnic, and it could be a uh, class conflict. And if we do not know, then how do we democratize the borders within? The remainders actually, in Taiwan, it will be the, the remainders of the Cold War and the colonial regime, but uh, it could be the same for elsewhere. And the displaced form of international antagonism in the domestic domain, uh, or the local borders, actually is a copy or the uh, doubling of the global borders. So how do we deal with this if we move beyond the domestic sphere and to the international sphere? Uh, that is a question that I think we, we are uh, brought by Professor Mook and uh, Professor Wang Hui's talk to, to rethink for, uh, for ourselves. Okay, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. 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 Thank you, thank you. Um, I can see that. Who's sitting there? Thank you. I actually have a question for you, Joyce, actually. I'm wondering whether you can further articulate how um, the, uh, your example of our waste work and how is that related to the uh, last few questions that you addressed towards the end of your speech? Okay. Uh, Every way for me is very controversial and problematic because we could see his uh, opportunist use of this uh, uh, 
visual, uh, either uh, images or there's a spectacular scene that's expected by the Western uh, art market and, and the gallery. But uh, very interestingly, uh, his exhibition or his uh, artistic in act or uh, performance uh, re-triggered uh, domestic uh, enactment of, for example, he uses a, mm, I didn't show it, but it's a, he, he, he uh, pro, pro, promoted uh, people to, to loan him money. And each, well, I, I don't know if that would be com too complicated, but it, it's, uh, on one hand, it's keeping the international curiosity and interest, but on the other hand, on the do domestic uh, sphere, it seems that he aroused people's uh, sense of uh, so-called uh, individual vote through loaning him or signing him this uh, 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 this uh, so-called debt receipt and, and so on. So um, that is only a, a, a pre. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, for, do you want to? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, sure, that'll be fine. Matt, Matt. Yeah, I have a question really, uh, I think, addressed to Chantal Mouf. And I, I'm kind of interested in the, uh, your, your very well-known text around agonism and antagonism. And uh, some the kind of response um, that Wang Hui gave seemed, seemed very interesting to me. And I wonder, I want to kind of tease out the, the function of the, 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 analyzing the relationship between uh, agonism and antagonism. And I wonder, um, it seems to me that the kind of definition of relations in these terms seems like a very good triage to um, instantly assess a relationship. But at the same time, it also has the danger of falling into a form of uh, idealizing relationships in a certain way, in that they fall into these a priori categories. And I wonder, in a way, whether as a, as a kind of, as a cosmopolitical view, it forecloses the possibility of multipolarity because it's inherently dualistic. Uh, so that's that's one one kind of question. Um, but it also secondarily, there's a problem with it potentially because in order to make such an analysis of agonism antagonism, there's an implication of a point of view which is separate from that relationship, and that also seems another mode of idealism in which the in which your kind of diagnostic tool falls into. So I wonder. Um, whether whether it's actually incompatible with a form of multipolarity. Okay, to Michael and our Italian colleague, and you were there, but Michael first. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much. That was a really illuminating paper, and it actually answered a lot of questions I was thinking of asking you when I first arrived. The, the point I wanted to ask you about was to take you very uh, early, to the early part of the paper, and in particular, the kind of um, theoretical foundation where you make the distinction, which I think is a really valid and useful and exciting one between the political and the politics. The, 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 while I think that distinction is really, I think, a vital distinction to be made, I wondered about the statuses of the ascriptions they were given. Bear with me. Poli the political, as I understand it, is antagonist, i.e. political intensity. The politics, on the other hand, becomes a set of machinery that operates, presumably, government. These aren't on the same plane. We have one that's a kind of theoretical articulation of a particular kind of series of passions, and the other one which is almost bereft of the passion and becomes a kind of a mechanical operation of, of policy. And I wondered whether... In, no, and, 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 well, it appears to be. Sorry, I don't mean to... I, and precisely my question relates to... Where is the passion in the institutional? And in, in that, and it seems to me that kind of gets you very close to the to the, the argument you were making about the agon, uh, about the agonistic, which again I enjoyed largely because it kind of put to bed, it seemed to me at least at one level, the kind of the, the claim that's sometimes made about agonism that without the force of the better argument, where would you be? Uh, sorry, I'll hurry. Oh, on. Keep quiet. Um, but, no, no, I can kind of. No, no, I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just want to just think, think that it's. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, 
So, again, if we say that the agonistic also includes the non-rational, that is to say the kind of, that elements, those elements that are within the rationality that would be ascribed to that force of the better argument, if there are, in a sense, a domain outside of that, but also kind of uh, relates to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the agonistic, I think we get to one way's question about what then are the limits of the agonistic, because we've already broken through. Reason is the thing that will hold it in place. What then is that, what is it that then kind of holds it to its limit? Um, I could go on, but I think you want to leave it there. Um, um, time call again. No, no, no. You say two, two more, but it's already, I, I could speak one for one hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, I, I have my two seconds. One, two, three, and then four uh, I have uh, a question each. Uh, the first is I was thinking to uh, uh, a conversation between uh, Gadamer and Derrida a few years ago. Uh, and uh, within the conversation, uh, uh, the activity, the, the position of Gadamer was defined as an urbanization of the Heideggerian province. It seems to me that uh, it could describe quite well what we are doing. You are urbanizing the Schmittian province. My, my wonder if this province is as big as, uh, as, as the world. Can it include China? Uh, to say it more explicitly, uh, um, <coughs> the dichotomy is ontological and ontic. That can apply to China. We were talking yesterday about language. Uh, in, in a place where the main, main language that doesn't know our distinction between verbs and nouns, how can we use the trick that we could use to, to build ontology to understand uh, that part of the world? And, and your final um, um, quotation of Schmidt was uh, even more perplexing. If I remember well, the pluriverse of Schmidt was a kind of distribution <coughs> of the earth. Now, distribution of the earth, uh, the, uh, a way of distributing the earth in, in different uh, uh, kinds of world, uh, sub worlds. Uh, while there is another possibility at the end of uh, pluriverse. I'm thinking to uh, the way we are trying, and I'm using the we uh, uh, because there are other colleagues, as Bruno Latour, working on this idea. The idea that the, the pluriverse is a compenetration of universes. And if you look around, we are, here is a compenetration. We are being with us, being with us, our universes together. Now, uh, and that, that's my, my question for you. Uh, is your uh, multipolar world uh, taking account of this compenetration. And the other question is, what happens between the uh, 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 agonistic idea of the contradiction within people, in, in that essay you are quoting, and the other say, uh, a few years later, a bombing the uh, quarter general, in which Mao turned this an agonism into antagonism within the body. Okay. Charles Taylor and, 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 and that kind of multiculturalism and multiple modernities. And you think then of multiple modernities from Etzioni and Taylor as very Judeo Christian. Etzioni's transcendental God, Judaism, and, and Taylor's you know, acknowledged Christianity and his post secularism is a totally Christian post secularism. You know, and I agree completely with Chantal that Chantal and our students, you know, if you're a secular in Africa, you're a Christian, that makes a difference. Muslims, as you know. Sure. And then the, the last point is, which I think I'd like to say this to both of you in a sense, what about political ontology and political theology? And I wonder if, um, I, I wonder if, um, you know, we already talked about that, but I wonder if political ontology isn't itself in its own way political theology. And that's because, um, and that's because um, the, 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 the dichotomy of, of friend and foe and maybe, um, somehow fullness and, and emptiness <clears throat> is very different to, um, for me, other modes of thought. 
I mean, in China, we did the seminar with François Julien uh, five, four or five years ago. Michael was there and, and, and Chantal. Um, you know, Julien says China hasn't got any ontology. You know, that, that ontology isn't foremost. It, it's, it's, it's way of life, it's mode of life. You know, the, the kind of Taoist and Confucian thing is not an ontology. What's, what, what's prioritized is not a truth or essence. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if political ontology it, itself isn't in some ways the political as a friend foe, um, as, as, as a fundamental, before we even have a symbolic, and before Durkheim's elementary forms. And I agree, it's so fascinating when you think like that. But I wonder if that's already not, in some ways, already um, presuming uh, uh, things that come out of the, not just not just Greek, but Christian. So both of you guys, sorry to be rude. Okay, well. Not rude, I love that. I love the paper. We have so many questions, and I would so like to answer to some of the important comments that uh, one made. Uh, uh, I don't know where to begin. Um, okay. Well, maybe to, to tell you uh, how I came to have this, this uh, uh, distinction between antagonism and agonism. Um, well, the old reflection on antagonism, I mean, that, of course, is in a in socialist strategy, and it's very much uh, coming from uh, uh, post-structuralism, Derrida, Lacan, uh, um, it, it, it is a, an ontological position that, uh, uh, and I insist on the that exists, that insists on the existence of radi it's a radical negativity. So it, it's against all the immanence, the laws, all that is, we, we oppose the, 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 the view. We say no. There is, but of course, here I want to say, being an, 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 uh, it's an ontological postulate. So I don't pretend, and I will never try to say, this is the correct view. You know, I think that when one begins to, 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 to speak, to think, one al always takes from a, a stand. Uh, and it's something that you can never, it, well, let, let's put it differently. It, it's, it's what uh, a, a post, is, uh, our reflection is inscribed in post-foundationalism. Uh, so it is, we re reject the idea that there is any possibility to ever found a great or final ground for a position. But we also uh, uh, are not simply in the, the view that there is no foundation, everything goes, you know. And in, in fact, the one we made very clear the distinction uh, is Oliver Marquardt in, 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 in a book, I don't remember exactly the name, post-foundational. Well, he, he distinguished part precisely the post-foundationalism from uh, anti-foundationalism. Because post-foundationalism is the fact that there is always an attempt to establish order but in a context of contingency. Or I think here I could make reference to a, 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 a very apt uh, description of Judith Butler when she speaks of contingent foundation. You know, th th this is, I think, very important. So they are an attempt to foundation, but they are contingent. So this, it's not, it's not uh, 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 foundationalist, but it's not uh, uh, anti-foundationalist either. You know, so, th this, uh, and so this is, we inscribe our, our thinking definitively in this uh, post foundationalism So for that reason, I say I th this is what we posit, but we don't think that we could ever, you know, uh, speak about the truth of this position. For, uh, and and the, we posit that the distance of radical negativity, the fact that there is a form of negativity which cannot be overcome or able in the Hegelian sense. You know, there is, and, and, and this is, Something which is, uh, um, of course, is linked to Derrida, idea of the constitutive, auto well, it does not use this term, but the, the way in which uh, it has been expressed by uh, um, André Satin, the constitutive outside, is also linked to the critique of essentialism. Uh, um, the fact that there is never any uh, 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 um, possibility of mass to total mastery. Uh, ne never any essence that can, to which we can have the direct contact. So it, it, uh, it's linked also to our uh, theory of, of the discursive, you know, that the so uh, society is always discursively constructed. There is not a society there that we could ever, you know, try to, 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 to uh, uh, know. So it, it, it is part of a very, very complex philosophical argument, uh, the, the, the reflection on antagonism. And of course, uh, um, th then when I began to um, try to translate that more in terms of uh, uh, um, 
what are the consequences of, of this thesis, the chemical negativity for politics? And then, of course, uh, the, the, that is translated in, in, in the fact that there is no consensus that could be ever uh, 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 completely inclusive, because radical negativity, you know, uh, the constructive side is precisely what impedes this, this uh, total uh, mastery or total, and that, of course, is not very important con con uh, consequences for uh, uh, open visit democracy. Huh? Uh, it's also linked to the fact that, um, in fact, here I want to say that when we wrote hegemony and socialist strategy, neither Ernesto nor me had ever read Schausman. Uh, um, and uh, after, uh, just when the book was published, <laughs> a, a, a friend from Greece uh, asked me, he said, do you know the work of Schausman? And I said, no. so I said, I think you should read it because you'll find it very interesting. There are a lot of points of convergence with your idea of antagonism. So uh, I read Schmidt, the concept of the political, and I was hooked for life. <laughs> uh, and, and I, and, but then, of course, it presented to me a real challenge, because, uh, and of course, we, we, uh, the, the, the way in which the idea, uh, the, our idea of antagonism is what Schmidt uh, uh, referred to, the, the political of the friend and enemy distinction. No? And, and, but of course, uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, the, I found the critique of, of Schmidt of, of, of liberalism, the fact that the uh, liberalism does not cannot acknowledge the political, I found it very, 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 very powerful. But of course, I was really uh, uh, also in a very difficult position because the consequences that Schmidt draws from, from, from this is precisely the, 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 say that the liberal democracy, pluralist democracy, is an unviable regime. You know, because <coughs> liberalism uh, negates democracy, democracy negates liberalism, there is a contradiction between them. So I wanted, starting from let's say, Schmidtian premises about the fact that there are, there is in, polit in politics, in, uh, in the political, we need to speak about the friend and enemy. But then, how can you, starting from such a position, defend the very possibility against Schmidt, you know, to take the, uh, uh, of pluralist democracy. In fact, one of my, uh, my earlier pieces is called Thinking, de uh, Thinking Liberal Democracy with and against Schmidt. And then, of course, it's when I began to develop the idea of agonism. Because I uh, began to, 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 to think that the problem with uh, 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 Schmidt is that he could only envisage, at the, the domestic level, because at the international level it's a bit different, the possibility, the, the, this kind of antagonistic conflict. By the way, what is an antagonistic conflict? It's, a, it's not, of course, and not all conflicts are antagonistic. An antagonistic conflict is a conflict that cannot have a rational solution. And, and of course, this is why to, uh, to, to insist on the existence of antagonism necessarily put into question the whole rationalism which is dominant in political theory. Because if you have a rationalist, you cannot possibly accept that the some conflict will not have a rational solution. It's always, but you must find ways in which... So, uh, uh, that I, I think that from that point of view, it was very important to start from this premise. But I wanted to show that it was possible, starting from Schmittian premises, to justify, to, uh, to show the possibility of a pluralist democracy. And in fact, the, the, the question of agony is precisely what allows me to, 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 to you know, answer this question. Because it, I came to, 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 to see that this kind of <coughs> conflict that cannot have a rational solution, not antagonism, it can take different forms. <coughs> can take the Schmittian form of the friend and enemy, no, no, no uh, common uh, 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 symbolic one, but it can also take the form of what I have proposed to call an agonism. That is, the, 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 it's, it's just a way in which this conflict is going to be put into scene in a different way. Through ex, uh, uh, institution, that's why you know the, the possibility for antagonistic, antagonistic is really done through possibility of institution that are going to um, let's say put yeah well uh, put into scene or, or give the possibility to this conflict to take a form which is not going to be the the, the, the common enemy, and this is why here in answer to the uh, first question also well. There is not a complete separation between, it's not that on one side you've got antagonism and on the other side agonism. <coughs> in fact, an agonism is a form of antagonism, but it's, it's a, a sublimated form of antagonism. You see, so in, in, in uh, 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 and th th there is a continuum 
in, at that level. Some conflict tend more towards the antagonistic pure, and, and some conflict tend more to the uh, agonistic, but, but conflict, it, you can't really distinguish completely, say that this is a, a, a agonistic and this is there. And of course, there is always the possibility of an agonistic conflict becoming antagonistic, you know, to reverting to, uh, to, to the, the present enemy. Because it is some kind of, sometimes I've used the, the term domestication, but some of my feminist friends don't like that, that term, so I, I, I try to avoid it. Sublimation, uh, 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 domestication, but it's a way, uh, or taming, or a taming, you know, of, of a, but, but still it, it is an antagonistic conflict. So, and I think once you, 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 you envisage that, uh, um, and that's what I, uh, for, for me, the main thing is that the specificity of uh, pluralist democracy is, and the challenge for pluralist democracy is to provide the institution which are going to make it possible when conflict arises that it's going to take an agonistic step. Because, and, and Smith, in fact, did not, uh, uh, um, could not envisage the possibility of pluralist democracy because he is saying, and I think he's right at that point of view, if we uh, uh, legitimate the, 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 the antagonistic conflict, we are going to lead to civil war. And, and of course, you know, in, in a, a political community, you can't just legitimate the friend and enemy because this is a little civil war. This is why he, he, he thought that it was, plurality democracy was an unviable regime. But if we envisage the fact that this kind of antagonism can take a form of an antagonism, then of course you can, and this is in fact my answer to it, you know, um, uh, to think with Smith and, and, and against it. So let's come to the, 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 the political, Politics. Well, here I think you understand what I call politics in, in, in uh, uh, the term of what Jacques Rancière called the police. And, and but, but this, I, I make, uh, for, for me, I, I, I will really distinguish what I, this is. Politics is not the police. I, I, I think they are also, or let's say they need to form of politics, which we could po call uh, the police in, in, in the... Um, the sense of, 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 of Francière. And it, it is, for instance, simply the kind of politics which consists in the reproduction of, of an hegemonic order. Um, but, but, in fact, for me, the politics is also, the, the, and, and princip principally, I, I must say, the hegemonic conflict. Uh, um, so, and, and, and the political, the political never appear the authentic. You know, the, uh, the, the political can express itself through uh, ontic uh, contradiction, uh, uh, ontic conflict, but, but the political is, is, is a, a, a philosophical thesis. It's, it's the thesis about the fact that there is radical negativity. That's what I say, it is really something that per, per, pertains to the, the, the level of, of the ontological discourse, and, and in, not at the level of the ontic of what happens and what are the ways in which the, the conflict appears. This is on the level of politics. And of course, there are many different forms of politics. Uh, um, there are hegemonic politics, and, and, uh, uh, or there is the, the, the police, uh, in the sense of, of uh, um, Rancière. But I, th I think, for me, I mean, the, the problem that I have, and the big difference I, I, I have uh, with uh, uh, Rancière, is that for Rancière, uh, let's put it differently, Rancière can't envisage what I call agonistic because an agonistic conflict is a conflict which requires conflictual consensus. So there is conflict, but there is consensus. For Rancière, as soon as there is consensus, we are in the level of the police. Uh, uh, there is either, uh, le, le, we call it le politique, the, le politique, which is or la, the police. But, but uh, the, the agonistic struggle is, is, is something different. It is something which takes place with part of consensus and which part of dissensus. And, and that is no place for us here in, 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 at that level. So you see, this is, uh, and, and here for instance, I wanted to say something about uh, uh, what, oh yeah, um, of course, I agree very much with what you say about, about Mao, and obviously I'm, when Mao speaks of the contradiction among the people who are agonistic, uh, except that, well, uh, not except, but I will say, yeah, but the question here we need to, to, to ask, and, and, and this is not, you know, uh, against Mao, but who is the people? Uh, 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 who is part of the people? 
because the people are not the population. You know, and I think, and I want to really insist about that, because there are a lot of people who say, oh, the, the people, we need to abandon this, but we need to think of the population. The population is not a political concept. You know, we need, the, and of course, as long as you speak about the people, it means that they have people who are not part of the people, you see? <laughs> and, 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 and then, of course, the, the, those are, in fact, both in, in, in um, the same way as I speak, for instance, with the agonistic struggle, uh, but not everybody is part of the agonistic struggle because the conflictual consensus has limits. So there are people who are outside the conflictual consensus, <coughs> and those are, so to speak, not part of the people. They, they, and they are enemies, they, or they can be enemies, you see? So I, I think that that's very important to, 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 to and of course, yeah, the, 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 you become an antagonist, or let's say, put it different, to, to be an antagonist and to be outside the people is the same. You know, the people define the limits of who are, who are the, the agonistic uh, uh, struggle. Let me see what else. Uh, 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 and, but uh, well, jumping for um, more in your uh, uh, answer to you. Is liberal democracy a <coughs> for agonistic politics? Well, I've tried precisely to, to, to answer that question when I have uh, uh, insisted in my presentation about the difference uh, the, between the domestic, and here when I say domestic, I want to, to insist that I don't identify that with the nation state. Eh? For instance, I think we can, uh, uh, for instance, in agonistic, there is, uh, in my last book, there is an article called perhaps an agonistic conception of Europe. I think that Europe can also be uh, considered as domestic, huh? so it's not uh, the nation state. But so the difference between what I call the domestic and international is that uh, at the level of the domestic, I mean, but here again, I mean, uh, my reflection is, is really a reflection. My, my first stage of reflection is all to, uh, uh, um, to use the expression of Richard Rorty, establish a, a, a metaphoric redescription. Of the, of, of the institution of liberal pluralist democracy. Not to read them through the aggregative lens, neither to the uh, uh, um, deliberative, but to an agonistic way. So it, it is to say, okay, well, let's look at those institutions from an agonistic point of view, because I think that it will really help us to understand what is at stake there. Uh, so it's very much a reflection starting from uh, uh, <coughs> liberal pluralist de de democracy. And this is why I insist in order to think of an agonistic politics, <coughs> is it, uh, or, or, or can liberal democracy be viewed in an agonistic way, you need uh, uh, um, to have a conflictual consensus. And, but I also say that, but this is something which, in my view, because of course, you know, the cosmopolitan will be uh, different, it is impossible at the international level. So there is a, a so obviously liberal democracy is not a condition, a precondition for agonistic politics at the international level, you see? That, so, so this is uh, because the, the international level, uh, well, we don't have the, 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 this uh, um, conflictual consensus and we can't expect it. Uh, I mean, according to my view, of course, some people will say, no, precisely, this is the aim. And we need to create this kind of, uh, but that's a cosmopolitan, and I, I precisely, I, 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 I view again those. those, those. Uh, of course, another question very important, to which I'm not, uh, not referred, but I, uh, not because I don't think it's important, is the economy, of course, uh, uh, obviously. Uh, and in fact, uh, I've also argued that in a, an agonistic, a real agonistic politics in uh, uh, um, uh, the domestic level uh, can't take shape if there is one, if there is not the possibility of envisaging at least an offering an alternative to neoliberal globalization. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if not, it, it's not agonistic. And in fact, uh, I don't want to enter into that uh, mm -hmm. again because it will take us too much time, but precisely uh, uh, my argument about, because one of the questions was, oh, how can we you know, re recreate this? <coughs> the first thing is definitely, I, I would say, for me there are two conditions. If we are trying to think at the domestic level, to create a domestic level, but of course for Europe, I'm, I'm, I won't have anything to say about uh, China, and I will really, uh, uh, I know a little bit about Latin America, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, at some point I would like to say something about that. But uh, at, the, at the domestic uh, European level, I think what we need is first to 
reintroduce this distinction left right which we've been told by the Anthony Gillians and it's, uh, it, that it's a, this, a something which is obsolete, you know, that need to be supported. No, I think that it's very important to introduce that. And it's also uh, 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 important uh, to articulate uh, uh, parties and uh, uh, social movement because, this, in my view, the crisis of representation that we uh, are witnessing today in liberal democratic societies is due to the fact that there, 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 there is no agonistic debate. You know, the, the, the center left and the center right basically offer the same uh, uh, kind of things. So how could people identify with uh, 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 a project? Um, in fact, there is uh, um, something which I am very critical of uh, uh, the limit of the movement, protest movement like the Indignados. You know, if you want to read that, you can read the last chapter of uh, uh, Agonistic, but I think there's something that they say which is perfectly true. They, they say we have a vote, but we don't have a voice, mm -hmm. and that's the problem with, with representative democracy. Mm -hmm. You have a vote, yes, but but you can vote for uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. Uh, that's, that's not the center right and center left. That's not a, that's not a vote, you see. And I think that that's the reason that there is a crisis of representative democracy in in our society. So the, the, the way out of this crisis is to revivify the left right for people who have also, the second point which is I think very important, to understand that I, I think that the, the, that's also not an important point of my uh, view. There is no possibility of a democracy that will not be representative because the, most of the, 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 the new the horizontal <coughs> movement say uh, uh, representative democracy is an oxymoron. I think it's completely uh, wrong because if you start from an um, anti-essentialist perspective, you know, there is no possibility of having uh, this kind of presentist, uh, no, uh, representation. Is that one way of the last word, we have to yeah. end in about five minutes, three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> 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 That's a question. That's one way left. That's still one way <laughs> Only there is a question about the Mao of Nation. Yeah, I, I link to that question because basically still, I think the Shanta have very clarified for me it's uh, the, the relationship between antagonism and uh, agonism. But that's why uh, related to the issue of that thing, why the Mao in the 50s, that, that the, talking about internal conflicts or the uh, agonism within the people, then in the 60s tend to the antagonism. So that's related to the issue that uh, I think that the Shanta's arguments about these were try to think about a certain kind of institutional mechanism. How that on the one hand assimilate the, the elements of the antagonism into the form of the agonism, right? It became the dynamic. And uh, that's the challenge at that time. I think that the, the, uh, the, the 50s and the 60s. Ma himself, it's a, he, he raised the issue, for example, the pit bull. He, he did. He said that the pit bull is a political category. It's not the, the stable. People is all, the, the, the always shift according to the social condition. Because in, in, in a certain social stage, the, the circumstances, historical circumstances, then those people could be part of the people, but on the other part, he, he was exclusion from the people, right? But his arguments, to some extent, there were similarities here. He says that the, even the antagonism or the, 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 the contradictions between the enemy and the people, or the, the us, can be transformed into the form of agonism, not negate that the nature of the antagonism. If that, for example, in the precondition of the, that's the mean, that's instead, I'm not talking about the socialism, liberal, not talking about historical content, I talk about the form. Basically, his argument that the given conditions that antagonism could be tackled in the way of agonism. That's why 1957 thesis was emerged. But then he said that the problem is that the 60s, why? How that agonism can accumulate it to the level turned out to be the antagonistic. So, which means that the, the always there were the possible change there. So the challenge is that uh, yeah, if we try to avoid that, then the, that's, that's the Shanta's argument. Maybe I mean, 
the, uh, the what kind of the institution no, institutional base or the mechanism for that. That's why uh, you mentioned the, the concept of the legitimate dissent, right? The legitimate means that the certain kind of precondition of the framework there. Otherwise, it's difficult to talk about the dissent as a legitimate. So that became the challenge, especially in the uh, uh, multipolar global situation, because that the uh, Basically, not only uh, the, uh, the Hobbes idea of the, uh, the, the nature, uh, but also even the uh, UN that uh, Babu mentioned this. Uh, the UN system was established in certain moment by certain powers. The order, how can that order can convince the people without their participation in creating that order? So that's the. Uh, issue in a global level, maybe is a democratization issue in, in, a, in a global level. Maybe this is the, 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 the my... Fantastic. Thank it's, great thing. It's, it's time to adjourn to the New Cross House and thank Chantal one <laughs> <Thank you>. way. <laughs>